today. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, we'll do all that on Friday, but uh, today we're going to continue with the living stones. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2 is where we've been teaching, beginning in verse 4. It reads here, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. If you've been with us, you know the analogy pretty well. If you haven't, the short end of that is this, God is building something. It's referred to here as a spiritual house, and what he is using are spiritual or living stones. So just like a stonemason would be selective and put the right stones in the right place in building a, a house, a natural house, uh, so that it would look good and function well and have longevity, God is building his spiritual house. This is a long-lasting, eternal house. And he's using people. He's using you. He's using me. When I say that he's using us, he certainly wants to. <laughs> he kind of has to get our permission. <laughs> if that sounds odd to you, God needs my permission. Well, he doesn't force us. He leads us. He tugs on our hearts. Come on, he speaks to us. He, he, he works in us that way. But he's not forcing us into our spot. You know, kind of like if you're ever putting a puzzle together and it kind of fits. You can't find the right piece. You just kind of... Mm. You ever anyone ever do that? <laughs> it just messes it up later. Uh, uh, he's not forcing us into a, into a position, but leading us. And if we'll yield to him, we'll all be in the right place at the right time. Uh, uh, but when seeking to be used of God in his spiritual house, being stones of the highest quality uh, is a very honorable and desirable pursuit. And so that's what we've been focusing on is becoming useful to God and if you're a believer, you certainly want to be that way. Uh, but it's kind of like if, um, you know, if you're a single person looking to get married, how many know all of your atten attention shouldn't be focused on finding the right person? Yeah. A good portion of your attention should be focused on being the right person, yeah. right? Yeah. What are they getting in you? <laughs> Right, And if you're in faith for God to provide, you know, you want to make sure that you are of, uh, I don't know, marriage quality for someone else so he can actually bless someone with you, not only bless you with them. Yeah. Uh, in God's spiritual house, we want to be of the highest quality individuals that we can be so we can be more used of him. Yeah, sometimes even in, in, in people choosing a local church to be a part of, which I include you to be led of the Spirit in that regard all the time, but uh, in seeking that, people think, well, I want to be a part of a, you know, a perfect, amazing church. And, and, and that's fine, just like in choosing a spouse, you want someone you like, right? You want someone of certain quality and standards. Uh, but at the same time, when, when it comes to church, it's not all about what you can get out of it. There is, there should also exist in each of us this desire to make what we're a part of better because we're there. And not, not, I just don't want to find the perfect place so I can be a drag on it and I can ruin it for the next person. No, I want to be a part of something where my, uh, gift, my giftings, my, my commitment to God, my prayers, my faith, my life is adding to it. And so as a result of me being a part of this spiritual structure, it's actually stronger, not weaker. Everybody with me today? Okay. And, and so um, we've discussed being um, quality stones, if you will, and, and possessing certain characteristics, character, availability. How many know if you have a great skill set, you're highly gifted, but you're never available when the Lord needs you, then it doesn't matter how gifted you are because you're still useless. That sounds kind of strong. <laughs> if I say anything extra strong today, just remember Christmas is at the end of the week. <laughs> and uh, yeah. we'll, we'll <laughs> amen. But our usefulness to God is dependent on what we're able to bring him, bring to the table, and of course our availability. If, if you put off the leadings of the Lord too long, you keep putting him off, putting him off. He deals with you. He, he's speaking to you. He's talking to you about you being a part of his spiritual house and being used of God. You keep putting him off. Eventually, he's going to find someone else. 
okay? Uh, we should all understand this. I, I recognize this, that the kingdom of God is not riding on my obedience. Now, my involvement uh, in it is, is riding on my obedience, my yieldedness, my usefulness to God. But if I keep putting him off, putting him off, putting him off, putting him off, he's going to do, he's going to find someone else because he's going to get this thing built. I mean, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The whole question is, is I'm, am I going to be a part of what he's building or am I going to be stepping off on the side, you know, criticizing and pointing out <laughs> if I just, or, or even admiring? That's a great thing. I can be a part of that, right? You can be, but it is up to us. We can't keep putting him off. Everybody listening? Everybody say, I'm listening. I'm listening. To, him, to him, to his voice in my heart today. One of these qualities that we need to be useful to God is called endurance. I could say it this way. We should be enduring stones, stones that last a long time. We need to learn how to stay the course. If I'm ever going to be useful to God, I've got to be in the game today and tomorrow. And that's a figurative way to say today and 20 years from now or 50 years from now. We've got to be long-term people, right? If you would, turn over to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. If you know Hebrews, then go there. No, I'm not making the coffee jokes today. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, and notice with me in verse 35, 1035. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence. Can you see who, who, who's in charge of that? If I have confidence or I don't have it, it's because I've either remained confident or I've casted that confidence away. He said, don't do that. Well, why would I need to be told that? Not to cast away my confidence, because apparently some do. So that means I'm potential, potentially vulnerable to the temptation of casting away my confidence. Otherwise, it wouldn't even be written here. He said, don't do that, which has great reward. You're going to be rewarded if you keep it. If you stay strong, you stay confident, for you have need of endurance. Let's say that together. Say, I have, I have need of endurance. Need of endurance. Yeah, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So we all have this need for something called endurance, which means, when you, that word in the Greek means constancy. It, it, it means a patient continuance. That means we're all going to be pressured. They were pressured in a certain way by their society. We're all pressured by life, by people, by trial and circumstance. And the goal is to get us to quit or to give up our confidence. The goal is to get us to be inconsistent in what we're doing. So we're up one day, we're down the next. We're, we're fully committed. We're, 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 you know, we're available to the Lord, useful to him one day, and then later we're not again. And he said, you're all going to have to do that. And basically, he, this is called living by faith. You find in the next chapter that it's by faith, it's only by faith that we please God. And just the opposite is it, it when someone is not walking by faith or they draw back, that's really the description of what he's talking about. When someone's walking by faith, they stay forward, they stay assertive, they stay invested, involved. When they draw back, he said, my soul doesn't, have, doesn't get any pleasure out of that. The Lord is not happy about that when we pull back, draw back, cast, cast away our confidence. But when we stay engaged, fully embracing his word, his will, his plan, he's happy about that. And rewards are on the way for that kind of life. But this, this word here, to cast away your confidence, refers to cowardly soldiers who throw away, throw aside their weapons and run from the battle. Okay? Now, we're not in a physical battle but we are in a spiritual battle and there will be temptation to cast these things away and leave the race, leave your, your place and, 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 and not make yourself usable by God any longer. Amen. And so again, that gives him no pleasure. So here's a, here's a, a word that's used multiple times in the New Testament that describes our lives. It describes our, our, our serving of God. And that's the word race. 
Okay, the word race, R-A-C-E. The type of race that we are running is not a race that is uh, a sprint or a short race. Give it all you've got, run hard and fast as you can. How many know if you're running a marathon and you run it like a 100 meter run, uh, you're gonna lose. <laughs> you can't, you have to have, uh, you have to have a vision that is longer than a short-term run, okay? Look with me, or you don't have to turn to this one. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse one uh, reads this way. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that's the believers in the heavens, okay? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily, easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So he said, what we have need of endurance in, the, in chapter 10. Now he says, run your race with endurance. So we've got to have long-term vision. If I'm ever going to be used of God, I've got to be able to see down the road more than a week, more than a month, more than a year. It's not about going all in and just pouring everything I have into this and then burning out after a short period of time um, I need the proper pace in serving God. Everybody with me? Yeah. So what we need to do, what we, again, I'll say it for the third time, we need a long-term vision. For ourselves walking with God. You realize we kind of did that when we got saved. When you, get, when you got saved, one of the things you said was this. I confess that Jesus is Lord, from Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, right? And you said that, and there was no expiration date on it. There was no for a week. You are Lord of me. You're the boss of me. You're the one in charge of my life from, from here on till the end of the year. I mean, it was an unconditional full commitment. By the way, he, com he committed to you that same way. <laughs> Right, so we get all the perks for eternity. But, but we, we committed our lives to him. And I don't know about you, but I'm not quick to commit to things. You, you know why I'm not? You say, well, you're not? You're not like an over really committed person? I, I don't mean that. I'm not quick to commit to a bunch of things that I don't know about or I don't know the duration, or I don't know what's involved. If I'm sitting in, in church and someone like me is saying, all right, how many will commit to... I'm listening real close. I'm, gonna, I'm not just to say, oh, I'll do it. Wait, what? <laughs> because if I'm gonna commit, I'm gonna do it. And I don't wanna give you my word that I'm gonna do something that I don't fully know the scope of what's happening or how long I, I'm committing to. I wanna know so I can be a person of my word. When it comes to the Lord, this is the one area where we trust him and the unendingness of this commitment. I commit to you forever, <laughs> forever. You, you, have, you have charge in my life. But that's the type of vision we have. When it comes to serving him, that's the same thing. Say, well, I commit to forgiveness. I don't know if I commit to doing anything. Stop divorcing these, these aspects of your relationship with God. My relationship with God is just all about gimme, gimme, gimme. No, it's about receiving and then walking with him forever. I've got to see that. This is what I'm doing. This is how I'm going to live my life. I'm not going to be up and down and in and out and unreliable, inconsistent, lack endurance. I'm going to serve him all of my days. If you're saved and you're 15 years old, then good. You've got another 100 years, right? And then in heaven, of course. But, uh, but here, I'm just going to serve God all my days. If you're 80, give it, give, give it your all until you're done down here. It's kind of like if someone is, comes into a relationship with God or hears some word, they get fired up on the inside. They say, oh, I want to get into the word. I want to read the Bible. And they say, I'm going to read the Bible this week, the whole Bible. And they do. I know people do, who, who have done that. And they say, so I started at Genesis chapter one and I just read the whole Bible. And then what? Now you're done. How many know this is not a book you read like a novel? Well, I read that one. I don't really need to read it again. This is not one of those kind of books. 
It would be better that instead of cramming all the Bible, which you probably didn't comprehend a good chunk of it, into a short period of time, why not make a commitment that says, I'm going to feed on the Word of God starting today, and I'm going to do it regularly. For how long? Well, just until I stop existing. (laughs) Forever. Um, Or my entire life. I'm going to do that regularly my entire life. Which person would be better off? The person who reads it all in a week or the person who reads a chapter here, chapter here, reads a book here, reads a couple chapters here, and they just consistently do that. Which is better off, the person who's really, really hungry so they go to the buffet and clean it out? (laughs) I'm good for a month. (laughs) Or the person who regulates their intake and they eat on a consistent basis. I think we all need to have the right balance in this. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to endure to the end. So I got to have the right balance of church and family and work and play. And when you see that long term, you're not overloading on these. Some people, all they do is play. You're out of balance. Some people, all they do is work. You're out of balance. Sometimes people, all they do is They may even be pouring themselves into the work of God, but they were out of balance. Out of balance in this regard. Are you neglecting the other responsibilities you have, like family? I'm not, don't don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not saying put your family first. Don't ever put your family first. Put God first in your life. Or everything else gets skewed and it's out of whack. I'm just saying in putting God first, you'll have time for your family, for your job, for for play, all these kind of things, but it's a long-term view. I'm going to serve him long-term. Amen. Now, now go over with me. Let me have you turn to one more place today. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Thank you, Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and and notice with me, uh, this is is another running verse, another race verse. Three verses. Uh, Paul writes here in verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. So like a natural race, you're gonna run in in, in a way, you're gonna use what you know so you can win, right? When you're running your spiritual race, should you also run to win? Absolutely, that's our goal. We're in this, to win. We're not defeating each other in in our spiritual race, but we're still in this to win the prize. We're going to run in such a way. Run in what way? Well, again, the sprint versus the marathon, you're going to pace yourself. That would be one, one strategy. He goes on to say here, verse 25, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. So just like a natural runner will be temperate, they will, uh, they will discipline their body, They'll have a certain diet, certain exercise regime. They're gonna do what's necessary so they can win this race. If we want to obtain the prize, which you see all over through scripture, including don't cast away your confidence for there's great reward, including without faith it's impossible to please him for those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Right? Reward, reward, reward is all over the place. The Lord says, I want you to have that. I want you to be rewarded. So you've got to uh, measure your life and your, what you do to that end. I don't wanna be serving God real strong for a week, for a month, for a year, for five years. I'm gonna serve him my whole life. So I don't ever envision a day where I'm doing nothing. Amen. So I said, Pastor, aren't you gonna retire at some point? Uh, not in that way, maybe in no way. But that's just nature of my calling. But, but I'm never going to do nothing for those who are retired from careers and that kind of stuff. Don't do nothing. You're almost out of here if you do nothing. You may shift and do something different, do what you want to do. If you don't need to work for money, I understand that. What a blessing. Now put your hand to something for, for the kingdom. 
do some things. Because we never just sit. Otherwise, you, we're, we're created for a higher purpose than that. We have to be engaged, have to do something. Okay? And so temperate means showing moderation, self-restraint. Uh, moderation, how many know good rule of thumb in a lot of areas in life? Because our bodies, without discipline, they will disqualify us from service. Saying, conduct your life in such a way. If you do this, what you're thinking about doing, are you going to be useful to God at the end of that? Now, you, you, how many know we can be forgiven of all things, but are you going to be useless to God if you continue down the wrong path? If we're thinking with the mentality of long term and I want to win, win what? I want to finish my race. I want to cross the finish line. I want to do what the Lord has called me to do. Then I need to measure what am I doing in my life that's going to interrupt that. I mean, no, there's people in heaven. Well, lots of people. Everyone in heaven is there because they've received forgiveness of sins. But not everyone in heaven is equally rewarded. You read the scriptures, you know that to be the case. So the question is, just put it out as a challenge. Maybe some people like to be challenged. In heaven, are you just going to be in the forgiven crowd? Or are you also going to be in the rewarded crowd? We'll all be in the forgiven crowd. Otherwise, we won't be there. To be in the reward, to have, to have something that the Lord says, come on, good job, well done. You finished this. You ran your race. You did what I called you to do. You made yourself available to me. And now I'm going to reward you. And this reward is imperishable. It lasts forever. Everybody okay? So we want to avoid short-term usefulness to God. Stay the course. Hold the line. Come on. Please, God, get the reward. That's what, what, why we want to do this. To switch to a different sport with motorized vehicles. I'm not a big fan, but I've seen enough of you know, NASCAR and that kind of stuff to know that, that when they race, they, at some degree of frequency, have to go into the, the pit, right? Have to have a pit stop. And when you watch the pit crew, they're, they're working at a, at a pace, right? Changing the tires, filling the thing up with gas. They have to do that to continue on the race. And, but I noticed that their goal is not to remain in the pit stop, in the pit for a long time. Well, I'm just going to take a break, get a lemonade, <laughs> kick back, take a little nap. I mean, no, they just lost the race. The reason for the pit stop is to get whatever you need to keep going. That's our mentality in God. I'm going to serve him all my days, my whole life. Do I ever take a pit stop? Yes. But you don't extend it. You don't camp there and live there. What are you doing for the Lord today? Or, you know, in your life at this time? Well, nothing. I've taken a break. How long have you been on that? Well, I just got busy. I needed to take a break. Listen, the race is continuing. The, and tick tock, tickety talk. Come on. The years are passing you by and, and the race continues on. Get back out there. Get what you need and get in there. Yeah. Good. So I need to take a break from serving for a while. Great. Take a week. <laughs> take two if you really need it. But don't wait. Don't wait too long because life is moving on. And you're not better off not serving. You're worse off. You're, you're separating yourself from the grace of God that is inherently in you to do what he wants you to do. You're living life on your own when you're disengaged from God's plan. Come on. Hallelujah. Listen, it is a demonic trap to disconnect. What happens is a slow bleed of, of coming to church. Less and less. It happens slowly, so it sneaks up on people. I've taught at different times over the last number of years from 1 Timothy chapter 4. You might know the prophecy. It says, now the Spirit expressly says, in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Why would some depart from the faith? Because they're tricked. They're deceived. It's, it's doctrines of demons that they're listening to. And, and they leave the faith. 
What, the, the reason why a, a deception is a deception is because you don't know what's happening. Right? It's like, do, do so many people over the last couple of years, did they realize this, that this was going to be them? You know, people who, who, who started, who stopped going to church because, there was, because of a virus going on and the fear-mongering that happens in the news. Did they, did they know beforehand? Did they know for people who came here? And I know you can't, you, don't, you can't even notice them because we keep growing, but they get replaced. Did people know last time we taught this? Oh, some are going to depart from the faith. Did they know it was going to be them? Or are they still in denial and say, well, I haven't left the faith. I haven't left the Lord. I just stopped coming to church because I want to keep myself safe. I want to protect my family from this virus going around. And, and, and that, really, that, is the deception running that deep? Do we think that people who depart the faith do so overnight? That one day they're serving the Lord with gladness and a whole heart and they loving on Jesus. And the next day they wake up and say, you know, I don't even know if I like him. I don't even know what's real anymore. That never happens. Never. It has never happened. What happens is the slow bleed. Disconnection. They stop serving. And they're, they're stopping serving being, being engaged and connected, involved, then leads to lack of attending. And they say, well, I still love the Lord. I, st- I haven't left the faith. You are. You have a losing strategy for life. That is going to end up. You're going to be so far away from God before you know it, you're going to look back. And you just fulfilled 1 Timothy 4. Over here, all of a sudden, you're questioning. Wow, I don't even know what's real anymore. I mean, my life is still okay without you know, being involved in the, in the church and being involved, and, and everything's still fine. I mean, I still believe in God, I guess. Because this is a dangerous slope that people are getting on. And, uh, amen, we got to watch out. Devil's tricky. Yeah, but I have a good reason. Of course you do. That's how deception works. A good friend of mine, I've told you this before, but a good friend of mine grew up, and as a child, he was, his family was in church, and he got saved at five years old and was loving the Lord, and, and then his parents, for, for some unknown reason, stopped going to church. Well, they didn't stop all of a sudden. They went less, 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 and then not at all. They weren't blatantly saying, we don't like the Lord, we, we reject church. They're not, they're not that. It just got out of the habit. By the time my friend's a teenager, he's, he's getting into drugs and alcohol, and he's an alcoholic, basically, and uh, just living in the world, crazy life. I, we met later when he was like 20, 21. He came back personally to the Lord, and later his parents, they got involved in church again and all this stuff. And I don't think they realized how much it cost their kids when they did that. It wasn't blatant. They didn't do it on purpose. They just were tricked into deprioritizing the kingdom of God, unavailable to him, doing their own thing, still believing in God, just walking away and their kids go crazy. I wonder if we could help save a lot of our kids from things like that. Everybody okay? <laughs> I, I read this. I, I don't know who came up with this. It, they called it the four generation fade. It goes like this. First generation. Uh, parents don't make church a high priority for their kids. Second, their kids grow up and make it less of a priority for their kids. Third, those kids grow up and make it no priority for their kids. Fourth, those kids grow up with no concept of God. Long-term vision, seeing the big picture. Sometimes we don't realize that these tricky demonic spirits, they do see it. And they say, I can't. I can't get you to give up your confidence and your faith in God, but I can get you to deprioritize. Then your kids will do it. And their kids, they, don't know, they won't even have any concept of God whatsoever. And that's this tricky, slow bleed of how many of these things happen. If church is unimportant to, uh, 
uh, your kids will believe that God is unnecessary. <laughs> Everybody okay? It got, it got real heavy. Huh? Sorry. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. When I talk about... <laughs> When I talk about church, you understand what, what I mean by that? I don't mean this in just an attending concept. I mean fully involved, embracing, and letting God use you and using your gifts. That, that, that's what, what I mean. I don't mean just attending something. It's like just eating is not a good way to live. Your body requires movement. It requires activity to be healthy. If all we do is eat, you'll live a short life. Spiritually speaking, if all we do is consume God's word and hear good, good teaching and that kind of stuff, uh, we're going to hurt our spiritual uh, health. Amen. And so we want to fully engage and recognize that there are times for the pit stop. Yeah, do that. But then get back in the game, in the race. Then get back and say, Lord, I'm, help me to see this for the long term. I want to fully serve you all of my days. I want to be used of you all of my days and I'm going to yield myself to you with endurance. Amen. Amen. Say it with me. Say, I'm not going to quit. I will not give up. I will not cast away my confidence. I will not run from the battle, but I will stay strong, trusting God, believing him for today and tomorrow and 20 years from now. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for working in us today. Thank you for guiding us every step of the way. You're our source. You're our helper. You're our guide in all matters. Oh, glory to God. We honor you. We bless you today. And we thank you for helping us to walk in the middle of your will, fulfilling your plan, being useful to you today and tomorrow. Help us to be constant in serving you, to stay tight with you in everything we do. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching the Life Church YouTube channel. You can join us live right here on YouTube every Sunday morning at 930. If you enjoyed today's message, share it with a friend. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any Life Church videos. For more information about Life Church, check out lcboise.com. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.